by the power of the Spirit and the power of the resurrection of our Savior, we're called to be the church in the world. In Peter's sermon today, we see the beginnings of the community of faith in Jesus Christ, its Lord. Peter gave the people the way to move on to new lives open to God's will for them. How did a Galilean fisherman become such a bold preacher? When Jesus had met Peter, Peter told Jesus, Depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Now he preaches. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. The author of this early history of the church, the Acts of the Apostles, was most likely Luke, a very learned Gentile. Luke's history comes closer than the writings of others to what we might call today history. He tells what happened to the followers of Jesus in the days after the resurrection. Luke notes, for instance, that Peter's listeners were cut to the heart. In other words, in hearing his words, they were deeply troubled. When they heard about the Messiah, crucified, chosen of God, they had broken hearts. The fortress of the heart is the most impregnable defense anywhere. Nothing can enter, nothing can go out unless the person is cut to the heart, that is, troubled, unsettled, undone, moved, shaken, unless the heart is softened as by God's kindness or some conviction about God's way of dealing with the world, people do not change. Someone, some teacher, must bring words and actions of a believer representing God to bear the message from God. Said the messenger Joel, if you regret your ways, rend your hearts and not your clothes. Jeremiah says God will take away our hearts of stone and replace them with soft, fleshy hearts. Words break and soften hard hearts. Is there anyone here who cannot point to a book you've read at one time or to an encounter with God at the center that has changed your life through just a few words spoken or read? Is there anyone who cannot remember a conversation with someone you knew looking back that had a largely disproportionate effect on the outcome of your life? A few words and a soft heart can change a life. And so it was with those who were gathered to hear Peter. What should we do? They asked Peter and the other apostles. And Peter made bold to tell them what to do. Repent. Change directions. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he made other arguments and exhortations, appealing to them to alter their lives. He held out God's salvation from the effects of what he called a corrupt generation. And the historian who is writing this concludes that those who received his message, indicating that there were those that day who didn't receive it, were baptized 
and that on one day about 3,000 persons were added, were counted among the dedicated followers of Jesus, and what the Acts of the Apostles comes to call the way, the church. It is in the Acts, you know, that the word Christian, the word Christian is first seen and used. And that's the only place it's seen or used in the Bible. Who are Christians? Simply those who belong to Christ. The church has always directed people to symbolize their commitments, to mark the changes of heart that they go through, the changes of life, to mark them. Baptism is one of the marks that changed intentions are shown to belong to Christ in faith and loyalty. There it is, a perfectly clear example of both the emotion involved in arriving at a spiritual truth and the evidence that people must go through inner brokenness, sorrow, and conversion to a different spiritual course, beginning with the sadness of self-recognition. The joy will come, but not before the struggles, not before the pain, not before the brokenness. Heart pain, chest pain, those are what we've known sometimes from life when life has gone terribly wrong. Now today, I want to share a little secret that's not really so secret because I think all of you know it, that the church is built out of broken people, not the least of whom, though continually surprising to many, are we ministers, ordinary people who deny Jesus Christ several times every few hours, as Peter did, whom Jesus mysteriously called the rock on whom he would build his church. The church is full of broken people. You may have seen the signs on the evangelical churches these days that say, no perfect people permitted. We are broken. How can this enterprise go on? We fairly fret, and yet it has gone on and on, for it is fed not of itself, but it is fed upon one whose body was broken, emptied, and whose Holy Spirit is now our own. God's is the Spirit who never soothes us quietly, saying, that's fine, don't worry about it, I'll do it for you. Anglican Archbishop John A.T. Robinson once said, that the entire teaching of the church is always in danger of being reduced to this dictum. Be kind to Granny and the cat. The danger of the church's doctrines being reduced to one phrase, just be nice to Granny and the cat. No, God's Spirit says to us when we are bent down low, get up. Gird up your loins, get going, and I will help you right early. It is the Spirit which says we will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, for I will be near thee thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Deepest distress is where my young fictional friend, 11-year-old Ellen Foster, was found. And where the brokenness of her life began to be healed through a providential love. Readers' hearts are broken and healed and healed reading this tale. Ellen Foster narrates her story in first person. 
descending to desperation because of having the wickedest relatives in literature since King Lear. She stole my heart with a saucy, exhilarating style that is primitive at the same time. She is a trustworthy character, and through her, our hearts are directly addressed. From the opening line, the child commands our respect, attention, and affection. When I was little, I would think of ways to kill my daddy. And it is not long before we learn why. But I did not kill my daddy. He drank his own self to death the year, the, the year after the county moved me out. All I did was wish him dead real hard every now and then. And I can say to you for a fact, I am better off now than I was. Two years ago, I did not have much of anything. Not that I live in the lap of luxury now, but I'm proud for the school bus to pick me up every morning. And I figure I made out pretty good, considering the rest of my family is either dead or crazy. Ellen Foster is the daughter of a loving and kind woman who is abused by her alcoholic husband. The mother, having suffered as a child from rheumatic fever, romantic fever as Ellen called it, Ellen's mother suffers now as an adult from a far more serious heart problem. In a well-tuned scene spun by the author, Ellen's mother comes home from the hospital where she has spent many days only to be met by the drunken father who lights into her in the kitchen right away. Ellen says she had not brought him his meal and he wants to know what she has planned. The father hates the mother for unknown reasons. Ellen says that the father sets up in his easy lounger like he is king for a day. What does mother have planned? He wants to know. Wouldn't he like to know what I myself have planned? On he goes about the supper and how come weeds are all growed up in the yard. More like a big mean baby than a grown man. Big wind up toy of a man. He is just too sorry to talk back to, even if he is my daddy. And Mama is too limp and sore to get up the breath to push the words out to stop it all. Mama just stands there and lets him work out his evil on her. Then he makes up a hundred lies about how he had to cook for his own self. Ha! If I did not feed us both, we had to go into town and get takeout chicken. Ellen's life is grim, and yet she is saved from some very terrible people around her through her deep well of perspicacity and the providential care of adults who are apparently troubled by Ellen's troubles. The 120 pages of this beautiful little book I liken to Charles Dickens' writings. Through her troubles, Ellen befriends an African-American girl named Starletta who lives not far away, a gift of grace and goodness. And when Ellen is at last orphaned, she is taken in and further abused by terrible female relatives. That is the one gift of stories about justice denied and justice delayed, that they break our hearts and they remind us to be just and kind. They help us repent of our hard-heartedness and cold demeanor, as well as any sermon that St. Peter preached to 3,000. In her first-person narrative, a hundred vignettes of her woe break our hearts. The scene with her in the school counselor's office is special because she, the child, is so incredibly well, however ill the counselor believes her to be. But then comes the horror of Christmas Day when her aunt and cousin give her treatment that would have completely demolished most adults. 
that only prepares us for the sweetest rending of the heart that is imaginable that comes at the end of the book. The great proclamation of Peter in Acts is the proclamation of a man whose embarrassing story of personal failure is told by all four of the Gospels. His story is one of the most wrenching accounts in all of literature. We just shake our heads to hear Peter bragging, even though everyone else deserts you, Lord, I'll be there for you. When Jesus tells him it isn't so, Peter gets angry. Even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. But he did. Three times. In one night. And yet, he became the most important leader in the early church. And the writers of his time rubbed it in, telling and retelling his horrible story of a leader's darkest hour. Why did they want the church to remember that it had been founded by the leadership of a person whom, when it mattered most, failed to keep his word. Well, apparently, the purpose of Jesus was predicated on the divine understanding that only someone who had done such a horrible thing could really be counted on to take care of his brothers and sisters. Jesus, somehow, in a divine way, understood that Peter could be counted on following the immense failure, precisely not because he had been a big success, but because he had known the total annihilation of his self-respect. He had lost his soul, and only then could he embrace the glorious triumph of the resurrection. And that was what the early church preached so loudly and strongly. Their gospel was not, be sweet and kind and good and friendly. It was not and is not, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. The gospel is, we all fail miserably and God loves us anyway. Christianity starts by telling you that you have no place left to go because you're already home free. And you have no favor to earn because God sees you in God's beloved Son. And things that you thought had made you unlovable are things for which you are even more lovable. All you have to do is explore the crazy mystery of your acceptance. Explore it. And when we begin to explore the crazy mystery of our own acceptance, we do not, do we not also begin to see the church as a collection of broken vessels, as Paul depicted us in Corinthian correspondence? Yeah, we're depicted as broken vessels or cracked pots. Being baptized means getting along and inviting along. Christ is made known most surely in the breaking of the bread of his body in communion. And so when our hearts break and are cut by the message of God's amazing love for us while we are yet sinners, then we can envision ourselves as the resurrection people God intends us to be and whom God intends us to continue becoming. Now to God who is able to do far, far more than anything we would ever ask or think according to the power that works within us, to God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.